I'm Sherman Stanford, and uh, this is Making Sense of the Chaos. Uh, lest you think that we're just spinning our wheels, there really is chaos in the world. Uh, whatever is not true is uh, either uh, a lie or it's an error, and only the truth will set us free. So if we're going to make sense of the chaos, since chaos also enslaves us and binds us, and we're bound up in confusion, we need to get rid of the clouds of confusion, and that will only come by shining the bright light of truth upon the reality around us to expose not only the error, but what's true. The residue, once the error is removed, is the truth. And that's what we're trying to do. We're anchored in Scripture because Scripture is our antidote to the tendency for human beings to seek to be the source of truth themselves. If we're the source of truth, we will end up building our house on sand, not a rock. And when the wind comes and the rain falls, it will fall as well. Now, there are seven uh, principles that I think we need to bear in mind if we're going to make sense of the chaos. We go over these every day because I think these are important as the framework for understanding everything. First, God created the cosmos for his glory, not for man's. Second, the jewel of creation is mankind. Third, although in no sense the author of evil, God, as the sovereign creator, ordained Adam's fall. Fourth, in Adam, the entire creation fell. The physical creation, the stars, every aspect of the creation uh, became corrupted, including all of mankind. As a result of the fall, God pronounced the curse of enmity between the seed of the woman, that is, Jesus, who will come uh, to redeem the fallen creation, including fallen man, and all of his elect, those in him. <clears throat> and also, this, this enmity is between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, that is, Satan, his demons, and fallen mankind throughout history. This is called the Great Antithesis. All subsequent human social experience is an outworking of this enmity. And seventh, the unregenerate are without excuse. They know God. Paul tells us that in Romans 1. But they suppress the truth of God in culpable self-deceit. So we've been talking about Excuse me. <clears throat> about the uh, creation, the fall, uh, what happened after the fall. We've been talking about the sin problem, and now we're talking about the sin solution. We <clears throat> uh, decided yesterday that the sin solution had to be a man, had to be uh, sinless, and had to also have um, God's be part God. Be, well, uh, fully God and fully man. Now, it should be apparent that each of the conditions that we've talked about as requiring satisfaction to accomplish all of God's purposes in creating the universe are fulfilled in Jesus as the promised Messiah, the Christ, the hero of the story who has come to raise, raise up and rescue the fair damsel in distress, which is the elect, his church, by recreating her out of the sight of the villain, Adamic man, and then to marry her and live happily ever after. All right. Symbolically, because Eve uh, was Adam's bride and was created out of his side, Jesus as the second Adam also has a bride, and she comes out of Adam as well. Because Adam is all of fallen mankind, and the uh, 
elect are chosen out of Adam. So uh, symbolically out of the side of Adam, just as Eve was made out of the side of Adam. The elect are made out of the side of Adam, fallen mankind. <clears throat> the Bible, the Bible is a, is an integrated whole. It's not a collection of disparate stories that have nothing to do with one another. Uh, if you want to understand the Old Testament, for instance, look for Jesus. He begins his appearance in one one, in the beginning, in the beginning. Because we're told in uh, John's gospel that it was Jesus Christ. It was through him that all the things that were made were made. So he first appears in the very first verse of the Bible. And then you look for him through the rest of the Bible, not only in the New Testament, throughout the Old Testament he, he will appear. Uh, and he, he generally appears as uh, in, in a type uh, of him. Uh, for instance, uh, Abraham, well, Noah first, is a type of Jesus who uh, is the one who rescues the, uh, the portion of humanity and the world out of the flood. After that, Abraham is a type of Jesus. Uh, Isaac is a type of Jesus. Jacob is a type of Jesus. Joseph is a type of Jesus. Joshua, whose name is in Hebrew, Yeshua, and Jesus, whose name in Hebrew is Yeshua, they're rooted in the same, same word. Uh, types of Jesus, the kings, David, <clears throat> types of Jesus, Solomon, the type of Jesus. But all of these are, are fallen types of Jesus. And so, of course, they have uh, the evil aspect as well. But Jesus, of course, is, is the, uh, the anti-type. Uh, there is no flaw or sin in him. Anyway... Seeing the Bible as one whole thing, not not a bunch of uh, a pastiche of, of uh, books and and, and 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 stories that have little connection with one another makes all the difference in the world. Now Jesus is fully human, and thus is qualified to stand in Adam's stead as the second Adam, the Son of Man, as he is frequently called, and, and as he often refers to himself. I mean, you read through the. New Testament, how often do you see the Son of Man, the Son of Man? It's referring to Jesus. Now, here's what you need to understand. Uh, the word man in Hebrew is Adam, spelled A-D-A-M, Adam. So when he calls himself the Son of Man, he is the Son of Adam which means he is the second Adam come to complete the work that the first Adam failed to do. That's what the Messiah is. He's also, in, even in the Old Testament, the Messiah who is projected forward, uh, predicted to be coming, is often referred to as the Son of Man. Second, John the Baptist presents him as the sinless Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. Now, this uh, statement made by John was made uh, within a Jewish context. Jesus had come down, John was baptizing Jews in the Jordan River. And uh, the Holy Spirit comes down, descends on, on Jesus and, and uh, also informs John that Jesus is the Lamb of God, come to take away the sin of the world. Now, for a Jew, the idea of the Lamb of God would immediately conjure in his mind the Passover Lamb. Well, who was the Passover Lamb? What was that all about? If you've read your Old Testament, you know that uh, when the uh, Israelites were freed from Egyptian slavery, the, uh, the last curse, uh, there were 10 curses that were visited upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians, each of those uh, representing destruction of one of the Egyptian gods. And the last one to be destro destroyed was 
the uh, the uh, firstborn of uh, of each family in Egypt. <clears throat> now the way that the Israelites were protected from the angel of death, who took the firstborn of all the other families in Egypt, was by uh, placing on the uh, the doorpost and the lintel of their houses the blood of a lamb, a, bl a, 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 a lamb without blemish, which was then slain and eaten, okay, who became the Passover lamb, the propitiation of the wrath of God, turning that wrath aside from each of those Jewish households and not uh, uh, securing them against the angel of death taking the firstborn in their homes. Now, the firstborn was always the first male child born. It did not, <clears throat> firstborn uh, can be understood in, in, in two senses. In, in terms of uh, time, the first one to come out, but also in terms of rank, uh, of, of the, uh, the standing, uh, the, the order of standing. Now, a firstborn child was the heir of the mantle of authority within the family. He also got a double portion, but more than that, he represented an office. He, he was the one who had responsibility for the family. So when Jesus is called the firstborn of all creation, monogamous, that's the Greek term, it, it doesn't say as the Jehovah's Witnesses, that does not mean as the Jehovah's Witnesses would have it mean that Jesus was born therefore was created, therefore is not God. It means that his office is as the firstborn of all creation. He has the rank of precedence above all of humanity. It does not mean that he was born. That word firstborn does not necessarily refer to being born, nor does it refer to the order in which they're born. It refers to order of precedence, uh, uh, authority, if you will. So when, when Jesus was called the, the Lamb of God, all of this was in uh, the minds of, of those who, who heard that. Because of Mary's impregnation by the Holy Spirit, Jesus was born fully human, but because he was born of the union of Mary with the Holy Spirit, he had the original unfallen nature that Adam had prior to the fall, making him, in fact, the second Adam. He was thus exempted from bearing the fallen Adamic nature, the one that you and I were born with. And because he is the sinless lamb, Jesus is qualified to be the sin bearer, we talked about that yesterday, in place of Adam and of all those who were born in Adam, those who have been called and chosen by God as the new humanity in the second Adam taken out of fallen mankind, out of Adam. The, these concepts are so fundamental, but are generally so badly skewed by modern uh, theologians and churchmen, pastors, that uh, you're just, you're, just you're, you're getting little bits and pieces of the picture, but you're not getting the whole picture unless you, 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 you careful in, in sorting through all of this. I'm, I'm not trying to uh, paint a black eye on all preachers. That's not, that's not the point, but i got to tell you, the state of Christianity today is horrible. And the state of teaching of Christian doctrines, of understanding Christian doctrines, is terrible. It, it's terrible. Anyway, getting back to our subject. Third, Jesus is not only fully human, yet unfallen, because he does not share in the Adamic nature, he is also fully God as the second person of the Trinity, the eternal firstborn Son of God, monogamous. Remember, we talked about that just a moment ago. This qualifies him to bear the penalty for sin against the infinite God on behalf of the elect. Well, how can we be certain that he, he was, in fact, God? Well, it's all over the Bible. I'll give you a, a, a few things. First of all, in John 8, 58, 
Jesus is quoted as saying, before Abraham was, I am. Now, to us, that just sounds confusing, bad grammar. Why did he say that? I am instead of I was. Well, who is the I am? That's God. So the reference he is making here is not to his having existed before or at the time of Abraham alone, although that's certainly part of what he's saying, but he is specifically referencing the claim of God to be I am that I am. Remember um, when, when um, Moses asked at the burning bush, who shall I say is sending me? And God said, tell them I am is sending you. I am. That's, that's the name of God. I am. In, in fact, Yahweh is, uh, um, the letters represent uh, that very concept. To a first century Jew, it, what he said was a shocking claim to divinity. They understood what he was saying. They did not like it. They did not accept his divinity. They said he was just a man. They said, how can a man who's not even 50 years old say that he was on earth when Abraham was on earth? This is nonsense. So they, they knew he was talking about uh, being God. They, knew, they treated it as blasphemous when he said that. The punishment for blasphemy was stoning. What did they do immediately after he said that? They picked up stones to stone him. And it was the Holy Spirit who restrained them, allowing Jesus to exit the scene before getting stoned to death. But that was their intention. And even in, the, uh, in his trial before the Sanhedrin the night before he died, when the high priest said, tell us once and for all, are you the Christ? And he said, I am. And the priest tore his garments and he said, this is blasphemy. He's holding himself up as God. He understood that when Jesus said, I am, that he was referring to, to God's name as applying to himself. Furthermore, Jesus' works pointed unequivocally unequivocally to his divinity. He restored sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, cast out demons, raised the dead, and forgave sins. Satan can't do any of those things. Th those acts were not merely spectacular, but since only God, as the creator and sustainer of the natural world, possessed sufficient authority and power to have performed them, they pointed to Jesus's divinity. They were miracles, either suspensions or abrogations of the ordinary principles by which God ruled in the physical realm. As proof of his claim of divinity, Jesus acted as only God could have acted. Another proof. Remember at the end uh, of, after Jesus was uh, crucified, and he appeared to the uh, disciples the first time. Well, one was absent, Thomas. And later when Thomas was told that Jesus had appeared and he was alive again, he said, unless I put my fingers in the hole in his side and in the holes in his hands, I'm not going to accept that he's alive again. So then Jesus appears again. This time Thomas is there. Jesus says, okay, put your fingers. And Thomas falls on his face, doesn't put his fingers, anywhere and he says my lord and my god and jesus said blessed are you because you see and believe now if jesus were a holy man but not god he would have chided thomas for presuming to treat him as god this would have been a terrible blasphemy he would not have idly allowed this Thomas prostrated himself in a worshiping attitude and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus affirmed that what he was saying was correct. Blessed are you because you have seen and believed. 
I believe what? Well, what he had just said. I'm telling you, it's all over the place in the Bible. It's, uh, you know, some talk about uh, the, uh, the Jesus consciousness, uh, nonsense like that, as if, as if you can abstract that from Jesus himself, as if he came to give a spirit of uh, awareness in the world instead of coming to save the world from their sins. At this point, the unbelieving world raises strong objections. How can Jesus be fully God and fully man? Now there is a conundrum. For the last two millennia, theologians have struggled to answer this question satisfactorily. Frankly, we don't know how God could do such a thing. But then we do know. We do not know how he created the universe either in the first place. Beyond repeating what he said, he spoke creation into existence out of nothing. Now tell me how he did that. You don't know. I don't know. Now, we do know that the Bible presents Jesus not only as fully God, but also as fully man. Not only did he do the things that only God could do, but he also, uh, he felt, he suffered, he tired, he ate, he slept. All the things men do, yet without sinning. He also forgave sins, as we said. He healed the incurables and the crippled, raised the dead, spoke without error. Is called God and the one through whom all things were made by John in his gospel, all of which are manifestations of divine power. Moreover, in addition to doing things that only God could do, he expressed the claim to be God in many places throughout Scripture. We talked about that. We know that the God nature and the man nature are presented in Scripture as existing at the same time in one person without confusing the two. They remain distinct. He's, he's, his, his man nature and his God nature do not confuse they, they, they don't merge into one another. They remain distinct. He's fully God and fully man in one person. Now, how can that be? I have no way of explaining that. It's, uh, I have to take that on faith. Why? Because it's dealing with a supernatural thing that I cannot know. I have no frame of reference for that. I'm just a man. But to say that what I cannot know cannot be true is the height of arrogance and pride. It assumes that everything can be known, and if it cannot be known, it cannot be true. Well, that just isn't true. There are all kinds of things that cannot be known, and all kinds of things that I clearly don't know, but I believe are true. And they, they are not made true by my believing they're true. They're true regardless of whether I believe they're true or not, and regardless of whether I understand them or not. Do I understand gravity? No. Do I fly off the face of the earth and out of space? No. If, did, uh, did the law of gravity only work for me when I believed in it? When I was a child and I didn't believe in the law of gravity, hadn't heard of it yet, did I fly off into space? Does that happen to all children before they are taught about gravity? Do they have to learn about gravity for it to work? Why no? It works whether we know about it, whether we understand it, whether we can explain it. It works. And the same is true about God. We don't have to understand God. And, and how he works for him to work as he works. The, uh, the Creed of Chalcedon, which was accepted by the church in 451 AD, abstracts from the Bible the picture of Jesus as one person having two natures. This is called the hypostatic union, by the way, by theologians. Uh, one divine and the other human. We may choose to believe it, or we may choose not to believe it. That's your choice. But we are not entitled to take the words of Scripture and twist them into saying what they do not say or denying what they do say because we find their truths either unpalatable or unacceptably mysterious. There will be mystery in the world. We are entitled to our own opinions. We are not entitled to our own facts. Admittedly, on first blush, the assertion that Jesus was both fully man and fully God appears a contradiction. It does. You got God and a man. How can he be both? That's a contradiction. Well, that's a misunderstanding of contradiction. If the Bible had said that God cannot be merged with man, that he cannot, one person cannot be fully God and fully man, and then we're saying oh, Jesus was fully God and fully man, that's a contradiction. 
doesn't say anything about that. It says God is holy other, and man is not God. But the man part of Jesus, we're not saying is God. We're saying the God part of Jesus is God, and the man part of Jesus is man. And they exist in one person, two natures, at the same time, without confusion, but they do exist. So there's no contradiction. To us as finite creatures, combining the divine and the human tends to lead to one of two errors. One, we find it impossible to distinguish between the two natures. This theologians refer to as confusing the two natures, seeing them as uh, somehow mixed together. Well, they're not mixed together. They stay forever separate. So when Jesus was speaking out of his man nature, there were things he did not know within his God nature. Well, how can that be? Well, I don't know. You don't know. No one knows except God. And he may explain this to us later on, and he may not. The second mistake that we make is to see the two natures as utterly incompatible within one person. That's called Nestorianism. You don't have to remember all this. <laughs> if we choose to erase the vertical creator-creature distinction, the two natures may seem indistinguishable. Okay? If you erase that, then it looks like, well, it's all one thing. If we retain the, the creator-creature distinction, okay, here's God above here, here here's man below, <clears throat> then how do they mix together? They seem incompatible. With God and eternally, entirely separate and incomprehensible, incomprehensibly superior being and man a mere creature. Remember, however, simply because we do not understand how a thing can be true, because it utterly transcends our frame of human reference, does not make it false. It makes it mysterious. It does not make it false. And that's not a cop-out. It's simply a fact of life. There are mysteries within the physical sciences as well. And they will tell you they do not know how things work. It's just the way things are. It doesn't mean they're contradictions. It doesn't mean they're not true. It just means we don't know. If the Bible stated that God could not assume manhood while remaining God, then it would be a contradiction to say that Jesus was fully man and fully God. It doesn't say that. Apart from the Bible's teaching its truths, we are left with the seeming impossibility of Jesus having been both God and man. A seeming impossibility, however, is not the same thing as an impossibility. Unlike an impossibility where contradiction is absent, seeming impossibility can be explained by appealing to mystery, as we've gone over and over. Although it may be very frustrating to deal with statements in Scripture that seem impossible to us, our level of frustration does not determine truth. Rather, our frustration is much more an expression of our finitude, we're finite, and thus our limited understanding than it is an indication of, of possibility or impossibility for God. As such, it ought to spur greater humility in us. To assert that God may act outside the regularly observed laws by which he runs his creation is not special pleading. If, as I have been demonstrating, the cosmos cannot be accounted for except by positing a God existing outside the cosmos he created, then further assertions of his acting from time to time and for his purposes outside his usual physical rules for his creation are simply an extension of the first principle. It is not a superstitious invoking of God to explain anomalies within the creation, which is what scientists and God deniers justifiably object to. However, their objection implicitly assumes a God subject to the cosmos. They complain of foul play because they misunderstand the Christian God. Because they deny and suppress the truth about God in self-deception, they adamantly insist that the God Christians worship, and thus the God they insist is presented by the Bible, is the limited God of their imagination, a God subject to the cosmos, not sovereign over it as creator. They object to such a God being redefined by men and subsequently imported into the cosmos after the fact to explain the otherwise unexplainable. 
and unexplainable. Their objection, however, is meaningless for a God who created both the cosmos and the principles by which it operates. God transcends and cannot be subject to any aspect of his creation, including the usual principles by which he operates it, physics. Rather, the creation is always subject to his will. That's enough for now. We're going to take the day off tomorrow and be back on Monday. We trust that you're going to take good care of yourself and stay away from anything that would expose you to the coronavirus. Uh, and if you should get it, we pray God, uh, God's mercy upon you, that he heals you. Um, it's a scary thing, but it's not the worst thing in the world. The worst thing in the world is evil. Okay? Not death, not disease, evil. At any rate, God bless you, and we will see you on Monday. Thank you very much.